Hey everybody, good evening. This is Jacqueline Lukman. And I'm at the Shahid Lukman. And this is Live in Coffee Current Events and Politics in Lukman Nation. The most dangerous show on the internet. Yes, indeed. And tonight, uh, we're going to live up to that uh, tagline, I think, because we've got a lot of very serious information to um, share with you. Not even going to take a whole lot of time to do a lot of current mm -hmm. events because what we are facing, what black people are facing in this country right now, we don't have time to keep wasting time on a whole bunch of other stuff. So we know that you guys are joining. Uh, we're going to give you a couple of minutes to hop on. Share this video. Share it. Invite your friends. Um, share it on YouTube. If you're on the YouTube link, Hey, Lisa, we see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, share the link on YouTube. If you are on Facebook, invite people on Facebook. If you are on uh, 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 Periscope on Twitter, invite some people on Periscope on Twitter because we have got to talk about where black people are in this country in relation to the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Report, the Kerner Commission Report, and why black politics is not only critically important, but for black people, it's the only thing we can afford to focus on right now. And I know that that's going to upset a whole lot of little baby progressives, but I don't care because it is the truth. And tonight we're going to begin to really explain to you in depth why that is. So look, as usual, you can find us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, uh, Periscope under Lukeman Nation, L U Q M A N N A T I O N. Uh, support us on Patreon, Patreon right. on uh, GoFundMe, uh, um, and uh, PayPal. Also, you can find us under Lukeman Nation, L U Q M A N N A T I O N. Um, what else you got to say, babe? Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome my brother, Donald Anderson, who's on. Hey, Donald. And, um, and, and invite other people because this is very important. This, this information and what we're going to discuss tonight is something that Jackie and I have been talking about since we started this format of Coffee Current Events and Politics. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we call it the most dangerous show on the internet is because unlike other people who are here to entertain you, here to feed you conspiracy theories, <laughs> here to talk about nothing um we're here to really um put forward um the case that we as um, black people in this country who have been here who have um struggled um in this country who have fought for this country who have built this country um the fact that because we have been denied uh sister um uh, systematically denied um uh, the fruits of our labor the fruits mm -hmm. of our support the fruits mm -hmm. of our sacrifices mm -hmm. Um, that we are still here in spite of being told um, that um, we're supposed to have some kind of um, um, uh, that we're supposed to have some some kind of part to play right that we're supposed to be a part of this society and yet we find that um, the latest information that is out um, really tells us what the truth is mm -hmm. and that we can no longer be um, uh, we, we can no longer be delusional about our situation, about our status in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we're going to have a very honest 
discussion. Um, it's not going to be pleasant. Nope. Um, we have to get out of the illusions of our fantasy lives. Mm. We have to get out of um, um, all of the magical ways we convince ourselves that we can um, overcome the systemic oppression mm -hmm. that has been our existence in, in this country and um, start to really put um, uh, forward um, not only the, the case and, our, and the situation that we're in, but also um, how we, as Jackie and I have been explaining for the last past couple of years, how we can get out of this. And I'm talking right. about practical solutions on how we can get out of this. Yeah, yeah. So um, please uh, forgive our crazy dog in the background. I know you hear him. <laughs> Um, he has decided that he's going to tear something up in the bedroom because we're not paying attention to him right now. So if you see one of us get up and storm off, we're trying to get him before he destroys our, our, our bed. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, how you doing? Uh, um, uh, Morphin Gall, what's going on? Let, let's just get into this. Let, let me just get into this. The Carter Commission was, uh, uh, convened 50 years ago in 1968 by President uh, Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, because in 1968, there were this, all of this, there was all this civil unrest that happened across the country in major majority black cities mm -hmm. across the country. What else happened in 1968? Martin Luther King was assassinated. And also the Civil Rights Act uh, that uh, uh, outlawed housing discrimination was passed in 1968. Right. But there were all these, people like to call them riots. We like to call them uprisings because that's what they were. Yep. Rebellions. Rebellions. Um, and what people don't know was what black people were rebelling against. So Johnson, Lyndon Johnson at the time, believed that uh, black radical groups like uh, 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 the, 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 the emerging Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam and, and other Black militant groups were inciting these actions across cities, uh, uh, across the country. Right. So he convened this commission basically to prove that, to have a reason to crack down even further on these uh, radicals, these uh, undesirable Black groups that, that they wanted to get rid of anyway, that the government was already spying on, that the government was already marginalizing, you know, that the government was already targeting. Interestingly enough, excuse me, the Carter Commission found that it was not any group of black people. It wasn't the Nation of Islam. It wasn't the Black Panthers. It wasn't any black radical group. It weren't group. the communists. It wasn't the, that's right, right. because there was, a, the, yep. they, the, uh, 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 Johnson thought that the communists, the, the Russia the Russian, narrative right. again. Yeah, that's, that, that's nothing new. That, yeah, that, that's why that's right. so damned offensive. That's why that's so damned, that this whole Russia convinced black people not to vote for Hillary Clinton. That's why this garbage is so doggone offensive because we've seen this crap before. So Lyndon Johnson um, was trying to prove that it was the black radicals, that it was the Nation of Islam, it was the black separatists, it was the black nationalists, it was the communists, mm -hmm. you know, it was the Chinese, it was the Russians, it was anybody making these black people lose their minds. Except white supremacy. Everything except <laughs> white supremacy. And interesting enough, the Carter Commission, a commission of um, uh, congressmen, senators, all white. Right investigated these incidences around the country. They went to these areas. They went to Detroit. They went to Chicago. They went to Washington, D.C. They went to Watts in, 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 in California. They went to New York and they talked to black people. Fact-finding missions, what Fact they call it. Fact-finding right. missions, yep. right. They talked to black people and they asked them, what is, why are y'all angry? What is the problem? Who is telling you that you you should be angry? What's going on? And guess what they found out? It wasn't anybody but a plain old American white supremacy that was the problem. As a matter of fact, the Kerner Commission uh, um, said specifically in the report, there was a report that came out of this commission. And I think the report was like over two to 300 pages long. So, so mm -hmm. these people were not, they, they didn't cut any corners here. They didn't sugarcoat any of this because in 1968, this country was basically um, on fire. Yes. 
and that we talk about all the time uh the picture was it time magazine it was either time or newsweek um where they had this iconic picture which mm -hmm. i always point out you know every now and then about um when they showed the picture of the Capitol building. Right, and, right. Um, and this was during the time when um, uh, Washington, D.C. was up in flames. Mm -hmm. This was right after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And they took an aerial view of the Capitol and all around the Capitol. Um, I mean, just the picture itself was just, I mean, when they say a picture speaks a thousand words. Yeah. All around the Capitol, you just saw smoke and mm -hmm. flames. I mm -hmm. mean, it was, at, it, was a, it was a war zone. Yeah, yeah. That is what that picture... Uh, we'll try to find it for you to share it with you. That picture is what a lot of cities around the country looked like. And the Kerner Commission found that the rebellions, the uprisings were in response to crushing, oppressive white racism. And we're not just talking about like a few white people running down the street screaming the N word. Cause I, you know, I don't, I don't want us to get censored by YouTube again. Right. <laughs> so I'm not going to say the word, <laughs> but we're, we're not, we're, we're, this wasn't like a few random white people harassing black people. No, this was white American racism that was codified and institutionalized mm. by policy. This was Mississippi burning on a na na nationwide scale. Mm -hmm. So... Out of the Kerner Commission came a report with all of these recommendations for what the government had to do to address these problems that black people were living under in these, not just in the South either. Let, we need to make that clear. That's right. We're not just talking about Jim Crow because by then Jim Crow was outlawed, outlawed. And then just to mention that all of the rebellions in the cities didn't take place in the South. Exactly. They were all in the North and on the West Coast. Exactly. So we're talking about all over the country. Um, so the Kerner Commission report recommended all of the legislative action that the government needed to take mm -hmm. to address and solve the problems that black people were facing in three to, I think it was three to five specific areas, but there were four areas um, uh, we are going to focus on we're not going to get to all of them tonight. We're going to take them one by one because right. they are that the 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 legislation that institutionalized this oppression then and now is that important to break down. Exactly. Four areas in particular. We're going to give you a link to the Kerner Commission, but the one area that we're not going to talk about tonight, but we're going to get to it um, in in the subsequent show was police brutality. In 1968, y'all got a problem with Black Lives Matter today? You don't like Black Lives Matter protesting? You don't like the way they protest? Oh, you don't like them being in the streets? A bunch of white congressmen in 1968 recommended to the government that the government had to do something about police brutality in poor black neighborhoods across this country because the cops were beating the hell out of and killing black people with impunity in 1968. And we're still having to protest to stop it in 2017. That's right. There's nothing new in the black community during that time. We always talk about the black community being heavily policed. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about um, uh, human rights abuses. Uh, it was so bad uh, with police brutality that um, Malcolm X, uh, one of his um, solutions to highlight the human rights abuse of black people, mainly by the police departments in this country, was to take the case to the UN. Mm, mm -hmm. He did. And that was in uh, back in the in the 60s. That was um, in the early 60s. Yeah. And, and what did we talk about a few months ago last mm -hmm. year? The UN report. There was a, U, a United Nations report. I think the United Nations Council on Human Rights uh, or, or the United Nations Committee on Human Rights that said again in 2016 that the United States has a problem with systemic racism and it needed to do something about it still today. So police brutality was one of the things that the Kerner Commission mm -hmm. found was rampant in black communities. And the government needed to do something about that in 1968. Right. The other three things were housing, unemployment, and incarceration. In 1968, 
So in response to the Kerner uh, Commission's report, Mm -hmm. the Johnson administration actually did implement some policies that addressed some of the issues that black people faced. And we all know those policies to be the war on poverty. That's where those policies came from, the Kerner Commission report. Here is where knowing history is really critical. Because conservatives would have you believe that the war on poverty was a failure because the programs didn't work. That's a lie. The programs were actually working. And again, we'll give you a link to the Kerner Commission report so you can see the report. You can read it for yourself. You can see what the recommendations were. And you'll be able to see and we'll show you what the programs that were implemented were. But the programs were working. There were gains being made in black communities. There were improvements being made mm-hmm. in, in education, uh, in housing, in, in, in quality of life, uh, in health. It, there were improvements being made in the black community. But what happened? i tell you what happened. The Nixon administration happened. And it was in the Nixon administration that the policies that were implemented by the Johnson administration Mm -hmm. to attack the issues, to address the issues that were brought to to the fore in the Kerner Commission report, that's when those social programs, those war on poverty programs began to be cut. And every president since then, and I do mean every single president, the Democratic presidents were not exceptions to this rule. Every single president since Nixon has continued to cut funding for programs that were implemented to address the problems facing the black community that came out of the Kerner Commission report. And they're still doing it today. And they are still doing it today. So while conservatives have told this country that the war on poverty was a failure, no, they lied because they know y'all don't, y'all don't pay attention to history. You, you, you all will share memes and you will believe conspiracy theories, but you won't get on Google, DuckDuckGo, or, or, or Bing, or any other search engine and look up war on poverty and find out what happened to those policies, whether they were actually working or not, and why poverty is much more rampant today than it was then, and whether the conservatives were telling you the truth. They weren't. But see, they had to they had to create a boogeyman, right? Right. They they had to create a boogeyman because they couldn't allow the policies to take their boogeyman away. We're the boogeyman. Black people in this country have been the boogeyman, and as we are about to show you, it's not just poor black people who are the boogeyman. It that there is no amount of money that black people can make in this country. There is no religious belief that we can have. There's no lack of religious belief that we can have, there's no zip code we can live in, there's no education we can get that can insulate us from what is being done to us to this day in regard to this attack on black people in this country. What do you mean, Jackie? What do you mean by that? (laughs) I know y'all are like, oh, she mad. I am. I'm gonna tell you right now, I am mad as hell. Well, we ought to. Well, we ought to be angry. For one thing, Lyndon B. Johnson, the Civil Rights Act, and all of the um, attempts by the government to kind of address some of the systemic racism in all the areas that you have just mentioned mm-hmm. came from a Democratic administration. Mm. The backlash against that was especially happening in the South, where the former Dixiecrats, the Democrats, right. all became conservatives, mm-hmm. all due to the fact because of the pushback to civil rights legislation. What's equally sad is the fact that Johnson, who who wasn't a perfect president, but did attempt during his administration to address some of these uh, issues, Mm -hmm. every Democratic administration after that, federal and local, did not um, um, add to his legacy. What I'm saying is they did not do anything to strengthen the, um, the civil rights um, uh, legislation and the suggestions um, that came out of this uh, Ker- uh, Kerner Commission um, or the Moynihan Report. They, mm-hmm. I mean, none, it, mm-hmm. right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. It didn't come out of that. 
So what we so and, and and the reason why this is important is because black people have been voting Democrat, um, uh, the Democrat Party since Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was the the, the um, was the period where blacks and mass switched parties from the Republicans right, to right, the Democrat. Right. So you had from Roosevelt up into President Obama, where black people um, um, uh, voted uh, majority for the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in federal and local elections. Mm -hmm. Yet the Democrats did not seem um, did not see it necessary um, to reward their most loyal constituency with not only adding to to strengthen the civil rights legislation, but they also but what they done was they sided with Republicans to weaken it and take some of the stuff away. Exactly. And and I know some of you um, who who are who are who are dim exiters, you, you know, you don't care. And 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 that that's fine and that's all fine and good. Um, but we need to make it very clear that as far as 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 black voters are concerned, we have no friends. We have no friends in this current political apparatus mm -hmm. because a, a perfect example of, of the Democrats um, selling black people out. How about Bill Clinton? Now, I think we said on, on when we were on loud and clear or, or no on pit, pit bulls and politics. I right. think we talked about it last night. When Bill Clinton was in office, the internet was not as popular and it wasn't as accessible and it just wasn't as big as it is now. So you didn't have people sharing uh, the, the the live stream of Bill Clinton making the uh, the announcement he did about the crime bill on Stone Mountain in Georgia. Right. With a platoon full of all black uh, prisoners behind him. On Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain, if you don't know anything about Stone Mountain, Stone Mountain is the mountain in, in, in Atlanta that has a carving of, of Confederate soldiers. Is that in Atlanta or Tennessee? Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, Stone Mountain is in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Yeah, when we went right, to right. when we went to Atlanta that that uh, uh, last year, a year before last, mm -hmm. we drove by Stone Mountain. And uh yeah, I, I was I was appalled at that that and, and you can you can see it up there too. Um, so we didn't have, when Bill Clinton was in office, this great internet, this wonderful social media that we have now to share, uh, that, that image that was absolutely done and orchestrated by a democratic president to send the message to, uh, the tough on crime voters, those voters who wanted to be sure that, you know, okay, you're a Democrat, but I just want to make sure you're going to be tough on the Negroes because that's what tough on crime really means. Right. He intentionally had that press conference about the crime bill on Stone Mountain in Atlanta, Georgia with a platoon of black prisoners behind a, all of them black. You mean to tell me nobody was white, white in that prison in Georgia? Come on. This but, was part of the Democratic Party's um, Southern strategy. Exactly. Which was playing to the racial fears right. of, of whites, of right. working class whites. Exactly. So so this, this, this critique of where we are now is not an attack on Republicans or conservatives. It's not an attack on liberals or Democrats. No, this is, this is telling the truth about the entire rotten white supremacist system that both political parties uphold. Both of them. All right, so so let's let's get into the stuff, right? So in 1968, as I said, we're just we're just going to talk about housing tonight. In 1968, the Civil Rights Act that ended legal housing discrimination was passed. That was incredibly important because, as we all know, at this point in the history of of, of our country. Um, the equity from your home is where a lot of middle class people built or have their wealth, right? And we also spoke about on this show plenty of times about how government intervention created the mm -hmm. white middle class mm -hmm. through the housing policy. Right. So if we know that it is in your home that most middle class Americans have their wealth, how about the fact 
uh, that local, state, and federal housing policies actually mandated segregation in this country. No, we're not even talking about Jim Crow. We're talking about everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, all across the country. Segregation wasn't limited to just the South. All white municipalities, towns, and communities were established throughout the country. And, and and there were a lot of them from Maine to California. We're not talking about a little small swath of land. There's a book. We're going to give you a lot of information tonight. A lot. There's a book called Sundown Town, A Hidden Dimension of American Racism. The author's name is James Lowen, L-O-E-W-E-N. What's a sundown town? A sundown town is a town or a municipality that basically enforces segregation by keeping black people out of the town. And the, mm -hmm. the term sundown town comes from the practice that a lot of these towns had by putting up a sign on the, uh, um, what do you call it? The, 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 well, uh, like, the county line or the yeah, town line, right. basic, not basically telling black people in word, don't let the sun hit you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still in this town. Now, mind you now, the sundown laws were basically, it, it, I mean, they really weren't even laws, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it was just something that um, that uh, police enforced, which had its roots in the, the slave codes. Yep. Because during the time of the slave codes, when they came up in uh, during the time of slavery, part of it was that plantations used to lease um, slaves out to work on other plantations. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was the rule was that those slaves had to get back to their plantations mm -hmm. by sundown right and the slave patrollers which are the modern day police officers mm -hmm. and they're they're the um um the the they, they were like the the ancestors for lack of a better word i hate to use that word for them but they they were the, they they were like a police force the slave right. patrollers exactly and they were the ones that were enforcing that so black people had to leave the plantations um, that they were visiting mm -hmm. some 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 plantation owners allowed um, uh, slaves to go and visit family members. Right. Some went to go work, but before the sun went down, you had to be making it back to whatever plantation you were from, mm -hmm. and the slave patrollers would come and check to see what you, you know your past. Right. right. So so those uh, that practice came out of the slave codes. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about that they were still enforcing this, and a lot of towns it wasn't just southern towns. Um, in New Jersey, I can tell you right now, right. up in, um, there was a practice in Irvington, New Jersey, mm -hmm. where, um, um, uh, you couldn't even, uh, uh, wear, um, sneakers in Irvington, New Jersey, because they called the burglary tools. Now they don't do, they don't practice that now, uh -huh. but even, um, where I'm from in Camden, New Jersey, I mean, we had white suburbs that you could not walk through at night without being stopped or harassed by the police mm. and asked why are you out here as to assume that we don't live out there. Oh, wow. So yes, yeah, so those are they, those are pretty big issues. Yeah. Uh, so so what is that what does that have to do with housing? Well, if you can't stay in a town uh uh if you have to be out of a town by sundown, how how are you going to live there? How, because see these sundown towns and these places like Irvin to New Jersey right. and and you know some townships uh, uh, in and around like where you're from in Camden um, the purpose of them doing that was to keep black people from buying or renting housing in their towns so instead of them like uh, uh, putting the law on the books because housing discrimination was illegal in 1968. Oh, and by the way, these sundown towns, some of them still existed well into the 70s. Okay. Well, I would say um, they some of them existed until the 2000s because True. we had an incident up in New Jersey again in Maplewood, New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. Um, a bunch of black um, kids were coming from um, a party. Mm -hmm. They were going through Maplewood mm -hmm. and they got stopped and pulled over and arrested by the police for coming through there at night. So, I mean, so, so this practice has never went anywhere. What I want to emphasize, mm -hmm. um, about the housing is that many people who are watching us now are asking, okay, we got the current commission, 1968, mm -hmm. um, black people being, uh, uh discriminated in housing, mm -hmm. discriminated, not in housing, but discriminated, um, 
having limited access to housing. Right. So it's right. not just being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, blacks were even um, uh, didn't even have the access um, through um, the financial institutions right. to even to be able to get housing. Mm -hmm. So then, folks are asking, "Well, okay, that was in 1968. The reason why we're bringing this up to you now is to let you know that 50 years later, in this day, 2018, March 4th, mm -hmm. 2018, mm -hmm. the the new report is out that states that we have not gained." Any ground. Mm -hmm. Now I'm That's gonna have right. to go out there. Yeah, you're gonna have to that. go get the dog. So y'all gonna have to excuse me for a minute. Excuse uh, uh, Mr. Lukeman while he goes and uh, reigns in Brewski Lukeman. But Sundown Towns existed well into, like Abda said, uh, probably the 2000s, and they existed specifically to keep those towns white. And they didn't just discriminate against black people. They also discriminated against many of them, also discriminated against Jews, Hispanics, Asians. But the, the largest targeted group of people uh, that they did not want buying homes or renting uh, 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 how, uh, houses or apartments were black people. So that was the informal kind of uh, um, du jour discrimination that existed across this country. But then you had the de facto, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. De facto is the legal one, right? Right. I think so. So then you had the de facto discrimination that was actually uh, uh, codified by the government, the federal government. We just told you about the practices of discrimination that were uh, um, that were codified by local municipalities, uh, city governments, communities, sometimes state governments, state governments turning a blind eye to these sundown towns and not enforcing anti-discrimination laws and not prosecuting uh, white people when they would catch a black person in a sundown town after dark and they would assault and even murder them. Right. Okay. So now, now let's get into what the federal government did because the federal housing authority was established in 1934 and it solidified federal segregation in housing by refusing to insure mortgages in and near black people, not just black neighborhoods, a black family, a black person living in that area. So this was called redlining. You've heard us talk about this mm -hmm. before many, many times. We've talked about this many, many times before. Um, the FHA funded and insured mortgages for all white suburbs, though. Right? So while the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, would not insure mortgages for people, for black people who wanted right. To, to buy a home. Who could afford to buy a home. Who could afford to buy. And, and thank you for saying that. Right. We're not talking about poor black people who had no money. And I don't even know if they had credit scores back then in 1934. I'm not sure. But, but we're talking about black people who not only had the money, but we're also talking about veterans. Veterans who, who the GI Bill was uh, crafted to give returning veterans the opportunity to purchase a home and preference in purchasing a home, securing a home loan and purchasing a home over civilians as a return, uh, a thank you for their service in serving in the military during the right. war. White veterans got that. The Veterans Administration used the redlining maps from the FHA that they crafted to discriminate against black people to also discriminate against black veterans. The Veterans Administration did this. Um, so while the FHA and the VA would not ensure mortgages or uh, support black people, getting mortgages and they would not insure mortgages to white people who wanted to buy a home in a neighborhood where black people lived or where a black family lived or near black people. Um, these federal agencies 
insured mortgages mm -hmm. for white people. So the federal government was responsible for codifying segregation in this country. Uh, 1930, this was starting in 1934. Now remember, FHA was established in 1934. The Homeowners Loan Corporation actually existed before the Federal Housing Authority. And the Homeowners Loan Corporation began this right. practice. The Civil Rights Act that outlawed housing discrimination wasn't passed until 1968. So that was 30 years almost 40 years of legal federal discrimination against black people in housing that the federal government did. Uh, let's see. Let me, let me, uh, well, before you go into that, okay. let's also talk about how it wasn't just the federal government that the federal government did, uh, through their policies, mm -hmm. really set up a situation um, for housing discrimination. As you said, with the FHA loans, uh -huh. um, they also, because when the veterans were returning from uh, World War II, mm -hmm. we must remember that this was the birth of the suburbs. Right. There was a housing shortage for mm -hmm. returning soldiers coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this creation of um, the GI Bill, which had housing included, Created the birth of the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Levittown was one of the first suburbs that was created. Mm -hmm. And Levittown um, had a policy. And this is Levittown, New York, Long Island. Levittown had as its policy that no black people could live there. This wasn't the that's, South. That's right. This was Long Island. Mm -hmm. And not one politician in New York was supposed This not the South. Mm -hmm. Not one politician, not one New York governor, not one mayor, not um, no Democratic politician. Not no Republican politician went and told um, um, uh, uh, Levitt, uh, I can't remember the, um, the developer, mm -hmm. but I know Levittown, his right. last name was Levitt. Right. But no one went there and said, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. Now, no one said that. So this was um, not only Levittown in um, uh, New York, you also have another suburb, Levittown in Pennsylvania, right? which right. also had the same policy. And so a lot of these suburbs were created with the intentions of having, um, uh, um, as they say, uh, um, uh, all white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and the policy was public. No blacks. Yep. I mean, they did not want any black people in, in, in those um, these suburbs that, that were growing. Mm -hmm. And so you had that. As, and because what I, want, what I want to emphasize is that it wasn't just the federal government. Right. It was the federal government in conjunction with local governments. Right. So, so if you, if here it is, if you're a returning black veteran, or, you know, or, or a return of black veteran and their families. Mm -hmm. Or black people that worked in the arms industry in this country that helped win the war. Right. Because we got to remember that when a lot of the white soldiers, with a lot of soldiers, period. But mainly when they went to war, the arms industry was filled with women mm -hmm. and people of color mm -hmm. who couldn't go over there and fight. So if you were one of those people who were part of the war effort, no matter whether you were, had a gun in your hand or you was making um, bombs, or you was doing other things to sacrifice for the war effort, then when it came time to divvy out the rewards, then all of a sudden they were told that um, you couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. So so, so where, where could black people turn to when you had the federal government and you had local government in conjunction with the police who made sure that you didn't come out there? Right. So the police were actually, um, 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 the, the police um, enforced these uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, these these so-called, as you say, sundown laws, mm -hmm. but they enforce this type of segregation. Right. They enforce this type of discrimination mm -hmm. and in controlling black movement. Mm -hmm. So what what my point is is the fact that where did where could black people turn to? There was no political avenue nope. for black people to address these things, and it didn't start being addressed until 1968. Some politicians tried. Mitt Romney's father, George Romney. True, that's right. When he was um, um, in the um, Nixon administration, mm -hmm. he tried to, um, he understood how unfair that was. Mm -hmm. And I think he was, I can't remember um, uh, what department. He was the secretary of what, housing? I think uh, he was the, the secretary, yeah, secretary of housing. Of, uh, of, uh, he housing. had tried to implement a policy 
to um, um, to um, states mm-hmm. that you could not get federal money mm-hmm. unless you desegregate That's right. a lot of the um, the existing housing mm-hmm. that that you know. I mean, it was so bad. And what happened was is that um, uh, the Nixon administration overruled. That's right. His suggestion. Uh, because he was going to withhold money. If you mm-hmm. had George Romney's policy was that you could not get federal money from HUD if you were to continue in these discriminatory That's practices, right. mm-hmm. and he was overruled by the Nixon administration. Exactly, and and we're talking about the federal government funding whites only communities, like you said. The 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 contracts for the developers. It was written that these houses the houses that were being built by these developers would not be sold to black people. That was the only way the federal government at the time would give these developers the money to build the suburbs if the developers promised not to sell the houses to black people. It was in the contract. So what happened to black people? Well, that's where the inner cities happened. That's that's how they were created. Black people were not allowed to live, move out into the suburbs. And they were pushed into the inner cities. Right. They were literally, and and these neighborhoods where black people lived in the in the in the cities in the central cities, the uh, the FHA, FHA drew a big red line around these cities, basically letting uh, the people in in the real estate industry and the mortgage financing industry know these are the areas that you don't finance mortgages for. And they did that, and the, and they and the, the way that they done that was we have to go back and look at how during the Great Migration mm-hmm. of black people from the South to the North and mm-hmm. to the West, mm-hmm. during the Great Migration when blacks were leaving the South because of terror, mm-hmm. you know, people want to say they were looking for better jobs. No, <laughs> black people was leaving the South because Jim Crow, uh, because of the terror of Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when black folks were were migrating out of the South to Chicago and New York and stuff. What happened was these local governments confined the black, um, uh, the, the black population to these, um, uh, these zones. Mm-hmm. Let's call them what they are, zones. We call them ghettos, but they're zones. And what the banks did was that they would go to whites and say that, like, if, um, um, well, let me get ahead of myself. What the local governments would do is that they would, they would um, purposely refuse to um, pick up trash. Right. They mm-hmm. would refuse to offer any type of services in the black areas. Mm-hmm. Then they would take that as trash piled up because they wouldn't um, they wouldn't have trash collection. Right. right. And they wouldn't do any street repairs. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't do any of those things. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was they would go to the surrounding white areas mm-hmm. and say that your property values are going to drop. Because these black folks are not taking care of their property. Now, what they're not saying is the fact that it was um, um, it was a conscious decision on city government to to not do those things. Mm-hmm. Even you know, but um, they used that, and this was one of the things. This is how one of the myths, um, uh, stereotypes of black people not maintaining their property right. got started. That's right. It wasn't that black weren't maintaining the property. It was that there was a conscious effort on the fact of local government to basically um, uh, uh, create this narrative. And they created this narrative by denying city services to black areas. Mm -hmm. And they allowed the trash to pile up. And what trash? Trash bring rats and they bring Mm -hmm. everything else. Mm -hmm. And what happened was they allowed these um, tenements to become overcrowded. Yep. And so this is where you get the slumlords and Mm -hmm. all this other kind of stuff. And all of this stuff was used to vilify blacks more, which when it came time for the federal government uh, and I'm talking about this during um, during the time before World War II, when they were doing this stuff during the Great Migration. Right. They used this false narrative in order to convince uh, when the gov- when the federal government was starting to um, uh, um, uh, 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 write legislation or promote leg- uh, promote policies mm-hmm. in order to build um, um, a ha- um, housing for the returning soldiers right. and create this this um, middle class that they were looking for mm-hmm. um, this this prosperity mm-hmm. um, for for Americans um, they use this 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 false narrative to deny black people because they said well see look how they were living in Chicago mm-hmm. look how they were living in Harlem mm-hmm. look how they were living in yep. North Philly look how they were living here yep. and so they created this narrative and used That's the same right. narrative against us 
to prevent us from having access to the same type of prosperity and housing that um, whites were given. And and that, that that is an excellent point because there's another side to that um, where white developers and real estate people would say, well, you know, we won't let black people move into an all white neighborhood because they'll bring our properties down. Right. But there was actually evidence to the contrary to that because there was such a shortage of housing for black people. There was, there was so, we had such a limited choice, so many limited choices of where we could live that black people were actually willing to pay more money than white people to live in a decent neighborhood. So, so it wasn't that we couldn't, uh, that, that at that time that, that, you know, we, we were, we would bring the property values down because some developers who were just wanting to take the money would sell a home in a white neighborhood to a black family, but they'd sell it at a jacked up price at an inflated price because black people were that desperate. Then the property values for that neighborhood will actually would actually go up because the, the sale price of that home was inflated because it was sold to a black family. But this wasn't ignorant whites who came up with this. This was banks. Nope. This was banking. This was banking's way of using racism to manipulate white home buyers. And let's take this a step further. Not only was it banks, not only was it real estate professionals, but it was also the government. And what does that mean? Politics, y'all. White people were able to use politics to create the vehicle for the uh, uh, the establishment of the white American middle class, and they were able to use politics to protect it. That so any black person, I don't care who you are, any black person who says that all we need to do is save some money, all we need to do is invest, all we need to do is pray to Jesus, and I love Jesus, but look. We cannot address these issues without politics because it wasn't our lack of behavior or lack of saving or lack of investing or lack of faith or lack of morals that caused these problems. It was politics. And, and this, we're talking about 1934, right? Mm. Where, where the, when the FHA was established. This was after... Okay, this was after all the racial tension across the country where mobs of angry racist white people destroyed black communities the red summer of, of 1919. We've talked about that on Brick by Brick. I'll give you, I'll give you the link to that show. A couple of shows. All the massacres that happened throughout history mm -hmm. by mobs of angry... You do want to talk about riots? Black people... Black people got nothing on angry racist white people rioting. And destroying black communities. I mean, killing black people, taking black people's property, and, and taking their possessions. Repeatedly throughout history across this country. This was after redlining. This was after the 1830 Indian Removal Act forcibly re relocated entire Indian nations. What was left of them, anyway. <laughs> to west of the Mississippi to make room for white settlers. This country, that was the army that, uh, um, um, what do you, what do you, uh, uh, that, um, the word just escaped my mind, but basically slaughtered entire Indian nations Massacre. and forced the, the rest to move off their land so that white people could have that land. And, and at the time that that was happening, of course, we were enslaved, so we couldn't get it. Now, 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 and, and because, you know. I'm sorry, folks, but, you know, I understand that this is a lot to take in. <laughs> and I understand that, you know, it's not a sexy conversation. You know, we're not talking about the return of Bernie. We're not talking about um, Dem Exit. We're not talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Russia Gate. Not talking about the return of Hillary Clinton. We're not talking about none of those things. But the reason why that, that this is such an important conversation, because let's face it, every time, whether it's DACA, whether it's some kind of pet progressive project, then let's get the Negroes on board. <laughs> yep. You know, when, yep. It's, when it's Bernie, let's get the Negroes mm -hmm. on board. When it's time to usher Hillary into uh, and, and and get her in the office, let's get the Negroes on board. Mm -hmm. Every time it's that, 
as always, we go to the church, talk to the pastor, promise him a dinner at Popeye's, and then all of a sudden let him let us get able to speak to his congregation. What we're saying is is the fact that because and there's a story on our page and the commentary. I really like the commentary because this person, um, sometimes the commentary is so good. I, you know, I'm like, okay, you said it. Right. Like, right, I don't have right. to, I, I, I can't, I, I can't outdo that. Right. So I had um, reposted his, his comment, mm -hmm. but he said this. He said, this is what happened when black politicians do not push black politics or black liberal, uh, uh, black uh, a political agenda. Mm -hmm. This is also what happens when black people hitch their wagon to everybody else's wagon mm -hmm. and support them. And then what happens is everybody gets their piece of the pie and look back and be like, you know, what happened to y'all? Right. So whether it's feminism, whether it's DACA, whether it's LGBT rights, whether it's animal rights, whether it's vegan, with all this stuff, you know, now it's the gun issue, mm -hmm. all of this stuff that. Um, um, white progressives look and say, this is this, you know, we're going with this. Mm -hmm. Bernie's here. We're going with that. Uh -huh. Or we're going with this and we're going with that. And, you know, y'all better come along with us. But <laughs> yep. we got you. Right. We, you know, you support us in this and we mm -hmm. got you. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you mm -hmm. help us get this person in office and we got you. Or you do like this and we won't forget it. And what happens is, is that we, we, we look at it. And, and, and what's so sad is, and the reason why I'm a little animated about this, because we had a chance to do something about this 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 slide, because J Jackie's going to share this with y'all. But what they basically said is, in fifty years, we ain't gained. Uh, we we have not progressed. Mm -mm. We are the only people in this country who's been here as long as we've been, who have not progressed at all. Yep. The same yep. amount of wealth that we had during slavery is the same amount of wealth we have now, which I think is like 1% or 1.2%. It's not even that much. Right. And I mean, I mean, uh, again, in 1968, it was 41.2% of, mm -hmm. of black home ownership. There it is. Mm -hmm. There it is. Black home ownership, 41.1% in 1968, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that today, 2018, 41.2%. One percent. What is that? That's not that, even one percent. That's, that's a tenth of a percent. Tenth of a percent. Um. Uh. Uh. uh growth. Black incarceration, though. <laughs> six hundred. Wow. Right. Six hundred and four. Um. Per one hundred thousand people mm -hmm. in sixty-eight. Mm -hmm. Um. In spite of all the racism, we wasn't going out here acting crazy. Mm -hmm. And um. And then here it is in twenty eighteen. And now there's 1,730 per 100,000. Now we went up in that. Um, black unemployment. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that we seem to be good at. 6.7% um, in 1968. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2018, in spite of what Trump says, 7.5%. Right. So, so here it is. We're talking about 50 years. You know, 50 years of voting Democrat. 50 years of supporting local Democrat um, um, politicians, mm -hmm. 50 years of all of these black folks who benefited from the civil rights era, uh, becoming black mayors, mm -hmm. becoming black city council people, yep. becoming yep. the first black this, the yeah. first black that, <laughs> uh -huh. you know what I mean? And the first black female this, and the first black male that. And this is where it gotten us. That's right. And if we don't understand that we got people who are going in these spots off of our backs, and they, we are the only people who vote. And this is the reason why when people come to me and say, oh, well, your ancestors, they, they died to vote. But they didn't die for me not to get shit from my vote. Come on now. So, you know, so yeah, they died. Some of them died for me to vote, but they didn't die for me to vote and not get nothing from it. And this is what's happening. We are voting for these people, and what's happening is, is they're sliding up in the office off our backs, and I'm talking about a lot of these black politicians. Mm -hmm. Where's the CBC to, uh, to address this? Right. Where's Maxine Waters to talk about this? Mm -hmm. We had eight years of Barack Obama, and we couldn't get that Negro to say jack shit about that stuff up there because he's so busy talking about that all ties lift up, uh, uh, all our ties lift a yeah. boat. Well, rising shit will too, yeah. and that's what we've been getting. Thank you, thank you, and 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 we're gonna like I said, that see you. Oh, you're so sexy when you're upset. No, it, it just gets uh, just, on my nerves because what happens is, you know, we would have 40, we would have 
a, a, a hell of a lot more people. If I was sitting up there talking about we got to go down there and fight for DACA, yeah, if we yep. would have a hell of a lot more people, if I was to sit up there and talk about chemtrails, yeah, or we talk about Montesanto, <laughs> or we sit up yep. there and talk about. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, um, Seth Rich, yeah, Seth and, Rich, and rigging the primary, right? And Bernie Not Sanders, and, and yeah, all of this stuff. But y'all still don't want to hear nothing about black folks, man. No, you still no. don't want to hear about it. And th and this is why I tell black folks we got to unhitch our wagon to y'all. And I'm saying this, you don't like what I'm saying, but we got to start unhitching our wagon because see, you showing me that you don't give a damn about what our issues are. And exactly. until we don't give a damn about, see, my thing is this, I can't support you if you can't support me. You want a progressive in office, um, a prog that's why, why, all well and good, but damn it the hell, if you can't give a damn about those numbers that we just pointed up here, then don't look for me to support shit. Because and I, that's that's just how I feel about it because right. I'm sick and tired of all the time this thing of oh here they go then oh here they go again oh here they go what we're saying is is the fact that see now we ain't got nothing else to take see that see this right. is the thing right. you know why y'all mad because see we ain't got nothing else left to take <laughs> so now the capitalists the bankers mm -hmm. the politicians mm -hmm. um, the billionaire class that want to keep on hoarding. We, they can't squeeze us no more. Because we ain't got shit. So now, all of a sudden now, they say, hey, um, you know, those folks over there, you know, they got they got a couple more. Because we said on this show last week, I think it was last week, and, um, you know, see, look, I'm supposed to be the, see, see, coffee current events and politics is supposed to be the more kinder, gentler me. See, I do this on pit bulls and politics. <laughs> but this is the thing, yeah. is that, um, we spoke on this show last week mm -hmm. how even white working class people who had an average um, medium income of $42,000 has seen that stuff drop to half, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. they can't take no more from us. So now all of a sudden now they're going to, to all of you that populate the coal mine areas, coal mining areas and all the, um, the, the industrial belt or former industrial belt, all of you working class white folks that's out there, now they come and squeezing y'all. Because That's they can't right. take no more from us. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can't see, we, we used to see it before, but the longer that we keep seeing, right, that mm -hmm. we don't have anything in common, the more that you think that this country is going to survive by constantly, um, you don't, for 50 years, and this is what we got, and you think that this damn country is going to go keep moving forward? <laughs> I don't see how we think that this country is going to be any successful when you got 45 million people, black folks in this country, and they, and this is the numbers that you have. Exactly. And you want to come and tell me that I got to support a Bernie Sanders, and I got to support this, and I got to support this joker, and I got to support that joker, and, and everybody keep telling me that I've waited for 50 years to not see a number change, and I got to wait some more? Screw, Screw you. you. It, especially when these same politicians, we're the ones who have to push these politicians who's supposed to be our savior. Because remember, Bernie Sanders was supposed to be the savior, right? He's supposed to be the progressive, save, progressive savior. But we're the ones who had to push these politicians, Bernie Sanders. Hey, you can't just talk about income inequality as if it's a general thing. You know why, Bernie? Because of this shit right here. I mean, you you gonna let that that speak that you know it's funny they always talking about preaching to the choir who knows more about income inequality in black people who knows more about um inequality um, um who knows more about in, inequality in black people and the thing of it is is that you know everybody act like and I understand it some of us have our coming to Jesus moment late mm -hmm. some of us you know sure. understand and and sure. look I am look you know I I came to minds when I came to minds and people come to theirs when they come to theirs. But what I'm saying is, is that when Bernie was on the trail and he was talking all, they thought that man that that like this was the tablets coming from heaven. We've been knowing this stuff. We were just waiting for somebody to speak about it. We've been right. knowing this stuff. Right. We had people like uh, Malcolm X and, and King mm -hmm. and others um, 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 who spoke about this. But they, they was the wrong shade for y'all. <laughs> had to take a white man to come along and say, yeah, they right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it is inc income inequality. Oh, yeah, there is this. Oh, yeah, it is that. See, when Jesse was talking about it, 
when uh, when King was talking about it, when Malcolm was talking about it, when Marcus Garvey was talking about it. Come on, man. You know, they were the wrong shade. You ain't want to hear them. We was crying. We was bitching. We was playing a race car. We was doing all this stuff. But then the government said, who that was trying to prove us wrong, the government came out and said, we're going to disprove these Negroes. They, they whining. They burning stuff down. We're going to prove to them that this is a good country for them. Where else are they going to get a better country than this? Where else are they going to live better than uh -huh. this? Then when they went out on their fact-finding mission, they was like, oh, shit. No, they were right. Oh, man. Oh, there is we, I mean, we knew, we knew we were screwing them, but we didn't know we were screwing them. We didn't know we were screwing them. Screwing them I mean, for, for, I think it's Fred <laughs> It's like, can you imagine what the members of the commission looked like when they went back to their hotels every night when they were on their little fact-finding? Can you imagine how much they had to drink to go to sleep? You know, finding out the horrors that black people lived under, having to go to Watts mm -hmm. and listen to the stories of black people tell them how the LAPD was killing black people in the streets, having to go to Oakland yep. and finding out that the reason the Black Panther Party was walking around the streets with, with rifles, with rifles on, on one shoulder and the U.S. Constitution in the other was because they had to remind the police, nigga, we know our rights. I might just get banned from YouTube for that. But anyway, <laughs> we know our rights. We're Americans. Black people had to remind the police that we are Americans and we have rights and you can't take our lives in the streets. Do you know how 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 just... It must have broken down the illusion of the wonderful, uh, uh, all-encompassing, all-embracing American dream that these uh, senators had on the Kerner Commission. You you don't go on a fact-finding mission and then come back and write a two to three hundred page report because you won't shook by what you found right. out, and and you don't tell your government you need to fix this shit. If you weren't shook, the members of the Kerner Commission were shook by what they found out this country was doing to black people in 1968. And let me tell you why what was done then is still being done now. Now, okay. now, now you know, I want to do a little role play, right? Okay. Remember that okay. movie? What was that movie? Um, a Time to Kill. And yeah. when, uh, what's his name, uh, Matthew McConaughey, uh -huh. when he asked that jury, when they, when the, um, when, you know, you had this jury full of white folks who couldn't understand why Samuel Jackson, um, who was the father, killed those two white guys that raped her, his daughter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they couldn't see that. They just saw Samuel Jackson as the murderer. They couldn't right. see that he right. was a father who was avenging the honor of his daughter. They couldn't see that, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, black men ain't supposed to be like that. Right. You know, but my thing is this. And I'm saying this to our white friends out there and our not so white friends, um, cause y'all on here too. So, um, but imagine if this wasn't us, Oh, imagine that you you had to explain to your kid, your grandkids, your parents, and you watched your parents work so hard and you wonder why they couldn't have what, what the folks in the next town had. You watch your father get up, um, and go to work and, and walk miles to go to work, as I've seen my father do when I was a kid, or see my mother um, break her back, changing beds at the hospital, and going to take care of um, 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 old, of old old people in their homes after she got done eight hours or sometimes ten hours worth of work, had to go back and take us with her just so um, she could be a parent to us, and I'm sitting up in somebody else's house. Why she's playing nurse nurse to them, and then I wonder why I gotta still live um, in Camden, New Jersey, mm -hmm. or why I gotta, you know, not that it was so bad. I'm not saying, but I mean that. I mean it was home. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, when I travel through Cherry Hill and I travel through all the suburbs of surrounding the, the city I grew up in and see these nice homes and stuff, and like, man, why we can't live out here? You know what I'm saying is, imagine. If it was you, imagine if it was your kids, imagine if it's your grandkids and you look at a number that we just showed up there and imagine that was your existence. Imagine for 50 years, you and your family and people um, and, and people that you seen all around you who worked and did everything that this damn country told you was the pathway to success. But them damn numbers don't change. So, so how important would you take this? Because don't sit up there and tell me that this would mean shit to you. 
You would want everybody in this damn country, uh, you would scream to the top of your lungs like, what the fuck is going on that everybody that I see around me who's working hard, going to school, three, four, five jobs, doing everything right, but then those numbers don't change. Hmm. Tell me how you would handle it. But see, those, but see, you know, you can entertain yourself with chemtrails. You can entertain mm. yourself Come with on. all this when it Come ain't on. you. You can you can have the luxury of saying, I don't want to hear that because it's not you. And mm. how did you get to the point where you don't have to be concerned about it? You know why? Because somebody somewhere in the position of power made the decision to disenfranchise somebody else so you can have, and now all of a sudden you got the nerve to sit back with your privilege and say, I ain't got to listen to that shit. Yep, yep. And, and, and let's make this real clear, because this is why uh, um, Mor Morlingal says, uh, thank you, some of the history I know, some is new. Um, that's why we're here. Because, see, we, we hear from so many progressives all the time, and, and not just progressives, white people in general, um, but especially a lot of progressives now who don't want to hear black people, don't want to talk about black stuff, don't want to, y'all want to unite, but you don't want to unite. You want us to unite with you. You want us to unite about Medicare for all and college tuition forgiveness and free college and all your white progressive issues. You want us to all stop eating meat. You want us to talk about chemtrails like I just love the chemtrails thing. You want us to talk about chemtrails, but you don't want to talk about black issues. No, that's divisive to y'all. You, but you always want unity because you think that what was done as far as slavery and discrimination doesn't affect you. You didn't do it. You, you're not a beneficiary from it. Bullshit. Yes, you are. You know why? Because in 1862, the Homestead Act was passed. What was the Homestead Act? The Homestead Act gave away millions of acres of land for free to European immigrants in this country. Millions. We're talking about 270 million acres of land. You know where the phrase stake a claim comes from? It comes from the Homestead Act where the, the rule was you had to pay a little money for the deed or the license and you could take a stick and go out to the land that you wanted to claim and put a stick in the land, stake, put a stake in the piece of land to claim that piece of land. That's where the term stake a claim comes from. During that time, black people were still enslaved in 1862. So you know we couldn't take advantage of the Homestead Act. And then when the subsequent act was amended in 1863, all right, we were emancipated, but the Homestead Act in 1863 required that you had to be a citizen. See, immigrants coming from Europe could apply for citizenship. Black people who had been in this country for 300 years, they're the descendants of people who have been in this country for 300 years were not citizens, just emancipated, were not citizens until 1868. By then, 270 million acres had been given away to Europeans, not us. Every stitch of clothing that was made from cotton during slavery, if, you, if, if, if it was worn, mm -hmm. you benefited from slavery. Every cup of tea that you drank, that white people drank, if you drank it, you benefited from slavery. Uh, um, uh, uh, tobacco, cigarettes, snuff, partook in it, you benefited from slavery. Some of the jobs that European immigrants had, overseers, slave breakers, slave patrollers. Well, you ain't even got to go that far. All you got to do is say that the reason why the wealth gap is like it is today is because you benefited from slavery. Because everybody else made money off slavery but the damn slaves. So if the slaves didn't get paid, again, wealth in this country like anywhere else is inherited. So if the slaves didn't get paid, they couldn't pass nothing down. Exactly. So, I mean, so again, we already um, established that um, the biggest wealth transference uh, one of the Ooh. biggest wealth transfers came during the time when the government created um, um, uh, the housing policy that they mm -hmm. had, which allowed access to returning soldiers and uh, um, and mainly the white working class mm -hmm. to able to have upward mobility yep. into the middle class. That was government action that did that. It was government action that 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 created the upward mobility for whites and black people 
the upward mobility um, for some blacks, it costs more. And even with the uh, and even with that so called upward mobility, mm -hmm. when they were able to move into certain homes, you came around and burned them out of it. So you know, so you know, so um, I, you know, it was funny. I remember um, uh, uh, looking at a, a documentary, mm -hmm. and they were talking about when Martin Luther King, Doctor Martin Luther King, when he went to Chicago mm -hmm. uh, to advocate for housing rights. Uh -huh. So this is a long struggle, and um, one um, white woman from. Um, Cicero, one of the surrounding burbs. Yeah. And she said, I don't care how much an N-word makes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live around them. Now, of course, you know, it's appalling. She's stupid. And um, you know, and that, you know, and a lot of folks felt that way. But here you are, we spent so much time as black. Now I want to talk about our fault. Mm -hmm. We spent so much time um um now mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. appealing to morality. Yeah. You know, the whole thing yeah. was because our our activist tradition mainly as black people come from the church, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's rooted in the church. And so a lot, so, you know, of course the civil rights, um, 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 the Southern uh, civil rights movement um, was Christian based, mm -hmm. you know, as we know. And so a lot of that activism was Bible based, you know, Christian based. And so it was a lot of morality appealing to morality. Right. Yeah. And even um, Dr. Uh, uh, Malcolm X said, you can't appeal to anybody's morality when they don't have any. Mm. You can't appeal to somebody's conscience when they don't have any. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about even today. What we're talking about today is what kind of conscience do we have in this country when we could sit back and see a population of folks in this country. I mean, we ain't talking about people that came from some. I mean, we came from somewhere else, but we're not talking about recent arrivals. Right. right. We're not talking about people who just landed up on your shores like the Mario boat lift. We're not talking about people who were escaping from somewhere and we came to American shores and this and that. No, we're talking about people who are in, who are an integral part of the founding of this nation, mm -hmm. the main, the, the building of this nation, the defense of this nation, yep. and the pride of this nation. Because mm -hmm. remember, y'all, look, David Simon, I like to always point this out, David Simon, um, um, uh, the creator of The Wire, mm -hmm. and, and very, very deep thinker in some ways, but he said this, and, and I always like to remind folks of that. He said if America was to, um, you know, uh, to, to disappear tomorrow mm -hmm. and some future archaeologists come and start to, you know, dig up what America produced that was so great. Uh -huh. He said it would be two things. He said it would be constitutional democracy and black culture. Mm. Black, wow. So constitutional <laughs> democracy and black culture. We... Have we are not we are we are an integral part of this nation, but we have always been treated as foreigners, mm -hmm. and right. that is That's the right. case. If you want to really boil it down, that is the case, and we have been appealing to the morality of people, and it hasn't it, it has not worked, and so we understand us new generation and those mm -hmm. that's younger than me, we understood that it's enough, the kumbaya is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That you know the appealing to morality is over. Yeah, we can all get along, but only if you if you support what I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's not personal. Politics is not a love fest. Yeah. Politics, as 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 um people that we admire have said, politics is a blood sport. Mm -hmm. And y'all know it's a blood sport because when y'all because look, you know it's a blood sport because you know damn exit. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, 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 I'm not with her. Mm -hmm. um, Bernie Sanders, Jill Stein. Y'all know that. Y'all know what politics is about. Yep. But what you want to convince me is every time I get angry about it. Oh, remember King. <laughs> oh, remember right. King. Right. You know what I mean. I have a dream. Right, right. You know. Oh, remember King. And you know, and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm sitting up here as having grandchildren now, and they don't see any progress. No matter how hard their parents work, no matter how hard their grandparents have worked, no matter how hard their great grandparents have worked, they got to come up and say, damn, why we can't get out of this ditch? Right. You know, so so we're not supposed to be angry about that. We're not supposed to sit up here and say that um, um, we are supposed to um, um, look after our own interests. We're not supposed to say that. Right. And, and if you feel that that um, that is something wrong with that then I can't ally with you then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then there, there can be no alliance with you. And let me tell you something. If you think there's something wrong with that, then, you know, then there's something wrong with you as a person. 
Yeah, but because there's no way these people are talking about they want a revolution. They, they kill me with that shit. They want, they want a revolution and, and, oh my God, we have to do something. We're running out of somebody said that on one of my posts on Facebook today. Oh, we have to take our elections back. We have to do something. We're running out of time. Heffa, we ran out of time 50 years ago. We we ran out of time 50 years ago. We've been telling y'all this is what's been going on all this time. And because it wasn't directly happening to you then, you didn't care. But 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 like you said, hon, we broke. And, and, and for those of my black brothers and sisters who think that because you have a little bit of money and you live in the middle class neighborhood, because we talked about income inequality, racial income inequality before, middle class for black people is actually poor. It's actually the poverty line in America. Middle class income for black folks, no, you're actually poor. You just have more money than other black people. <laughs> you're not middle class. But, but for those of us who think that we are not in this, this, this situation because we have a little bit of money, we own our home and we have a nice car in the driveway, we got a little bit of, you know, decent job, got a little decent paycheck, got a degree. Uh, no, this, this is you too, because he, here's why. And, and I, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to end this show with some current examples of the same kind of discrimination in housing that we were being faced with in 1968 that we're being faced with today. Here's one. Here's the first one. This is from an article in the Washington Post that was uh, published two years ago. Uh, and yes, I'm gonna give you the links to all of these articles um, that shows discrimination in housing still exists. Redlining is still practiced by banks. Remember, the, the, the Civil Rights Act that supposedly outlawed redlining mm -hmm. was passed in 1968. That law was supposed to make it illegal. Well, then why is it that in 2015, HUD's analysis of Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data concluded that a bank disproportionately denied qualified, qualified, damn it. We ain't talking about broke ass, no job having, just got out of prison for killing 19 people, 45 babies, baby daddy having. No, we're not talking about people like that. We are talking about black people who have our qualified loan applications. Remember, and that's remember, most of us. Remember who did everything right? Did everything right. HUD's analysis of Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data showed that the bank disproportionately denied qualified loan applicants in predominantly minority neighborhoods in Chicago, Milwaukee, and Minneapolis compared to other lenders operating in the same communities. Now Associated, this was the bank, the Associated Bank, agreed to a long list of actions to make amends over the next three years. It, it had to finance nearly $200 million in home loans. You know what? Fuck financing a home loan. No, you pay for the fucking mortgage. You kept me from getting a mortgage. You gave me a higher rate than a white person and we had the same qualifications. Why should you finance anything? You owe me. And anybody who says that we are not owed those kinds of reparations, because that's what it is, you can kiss my behind. Because you can't steal from me. You cannot steal opportunity from me. You can't steal uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity to, to uh, build wealth from my family. You can't steal a home from me and my family and then walk away with a oops. Well, no, yeah, yeah. We'll, see, we'll, I, we'll still finance you now. We'll, we'll still, we'll still, you, how are you going to steal a chance for me to have a home for my family, but then you're going to be the one that I still owe money to get the hell out of here. The hell is wrong with, and, and you got black people talking about, oh no, we can't ask for a handout. That's not a handout, dumbass. That's justice. Because if I break into your house, and take your flat screen TV, and I get caught, guess what the judge is going to tell me right after he sentences me to 15 years in jail for breaking and entering? I'm going to have to pay you back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to pay you back for the television. I'm going to have to pay you back for breaking, for having to fix your door. I'm going to have to pay the courts back 
for them trying me. I'm going to have to pay my lawyers back. I'm going to have to pay your lawyers back. So explain to me if that's the way it's done as far as restitution in the court system is concerned. How is it that when black people are denied an opportunity for a home for their families, we don't get restitution? Get the hell out of here with it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, but, but I'm going to tell you um, why, why we're so angry about their attitude. And this is not related to this, but this is, we said that, you know, those, those of you who've been with us, we always told you that Jack and I was going to take you to the laundry room. The laundry room <laughs> is, you know, it's, it's, it's like what black folks talk about when white folks ain't around. Mm -hmm. Right now, one of the things is the fact that, and this is not related to housing. This is just the attitude that makes some blacks like me upset um uh and, and and it's not all white folks who do this so uh, some of these some of this reaction comes from uh other uh groups of people who come to this country or who raised in this country but it's the it's i call it it's the white supremacist way of dealing with black suffering mm -hmm. there's a brother we posted on a page and he was incarcerated for 23 years for a crime he didn't commit I think it was in Kansas. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Kansas government, uh, state government, is not giving this brother a dime. 23 years. They know he didn't do it. The the racist-ass cop who um, who um, uh, threatened witnesses to put him in prison is also the same cop who got other black men arrested. Mm -hmm. And now the state attorney is looking at him. He's retired, living off his stolen funds and all this other kind of stuff. And think he, you know, think he's just going to just fade away in the security. Mm -hmm. But the state attorney said, look, we're going to look into this guy and see if he's done railroaded other people. Now, back to this guy. So he comes out after 23 years of um, doing, being incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. The state um, government of Kansas is not giving him a dime. Not right? a dime. Now, this is what gets me. That, now, that's bad enough. What gets me is, is that the anchor, and she's not white, the anchor sits up there. And because um, uh, the brother, he's, he's learning to be a barber. And he's trying to put his life, you know, he's trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. And this chick, for lack of a better term, you know, she's <laughs> now, now she's, she's a journalist. She's part of the media. And the worst that this chick can say is, she gets up there and say, oh my God, talking about the indomitable will of the human spirit. She said, I am so glad that he's able to turn the page. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm saying you're you're the media. That should not be your response. Your response is why he that a man could lose 23 years of his life and the state determined that it ain't worth nothing. Not um not this. Oh, I'm so glad that he's able to turn the page. This is the reason why I said on this show so many times that you know what y'all problem is a bunch of y'all some psychotic motherfuckers who sit up there and and black suffering to y'all don't mean nothing. It's enjoyment to some of y'all. Oh, I'm so glad that he's able to turn oh the page. My God. And I'm saying like, how could you take somebody who lost 23 years of his life who can't get it back and you're in the media and you don't ask the question why that is. And, and you know why, you know why I think that, that it's like enjoyment for some, for some non-black people? I seriously do. Because people seem to get off on us going through hell and then coming out and saying, well, I forgive y'all. It's like, y'all, y'all wait for us. Oh, and, and that's the funny thing yeah. because the first thing they, because I always said mm -hmm. that I'm waiting for that one guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for that one guy who don't stick to that script. Because yep. even this guy. I mean, and I understand that forgiveness a lot of times is for me and it's not for you. And a lot of times people use that in order to cope. And I understand that. I haven't been in that situation. So I don't, you know, some people, that's what they use sometimes to stop going out here committing mass shootings. So right. they'd be like, you know what? I have to forgive this person because after taking 23 years of my, my life, I'm ready to kill up a bunch of motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so mm -hmm. now it's like, Okay, I have to forgive because I don't want to go back to prison. Right. Now, but this is the thing. Why is it that the first thing that um, um, this society wants to know, especially when it's black people, and especially when it's black men, mm. the first thing they want to say is, are you angry? Are you bitter? Are you bitter? You know, 
man, I lost 45 years of my life, man, because y'all, because I was too poor to afford proper defense. Come on. I was too poor to afford someone to go out there and investigate for me. I was too, I had to rely on this jack up ass public defender mm -hmm. who don't care about me, who's telling me, oh, well, you could just lift weights and basketball and you'll be home in no time. Right. And that's, that's what I'm stuck with. Right. And then I do 45 years because some racist ass cop um, decided that, um, you know, he's going to do America a favor and put away as many blacks as he could. And then what happens is some 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 good souls, some a lot of my whites, some good souls from the Innocent Project who come out and, 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 and you know, just because they, they're good people and realize that an injustice has been done mm -hmm. and then get me out. And then the first thing is not outrage. And I'm talking about the media here. Right, it's right. not outrage that we got a system that do this to people. No, no. The first thing you want to know is when I leave the door is, are you angry? Do you forgive? You know, what church you go to? <laughs> Did you did you accept Jesus when you were inside oh, for 23 years this is uh, serving time for a crime that you didn't commit that you were railroaded into commi in, into serving time for by a racist cop merely because of the color of your skin But I want that one brother and I'm waiting for I hope God allows me to live long <laughs> enough for this one guy The one I, dude I want this one dude and I hope he's big I hope he's black <laughs> And I, hope, and I hope he's bald headed <laughs> and I hope that he got muscles up to the ceiling because when he comes out, I want that one little, little Asianist reporter because there's a lot of them and, and, and come up there and say, look, um, so you just lost 50 years of your life. Um, are you, are you motherfucking yeah. right. Motherfucking and if I could get to right. that prosecutor right now, I would rip his motherfucking head off. That's what I'm waiting for that dude. I want him to come out and be like, you know, yeah, I'm waiting for him and Kate fear motherfucker. <laughs> Kate fear coming for you. The near ain't gonna have nothing. He ain't gonna have nothing on you. Ain't seen speaking in tongues. <laughs> right, we gotta wrap. I this mean, up. The, 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 we 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 respond sometimes to centuries, fucking centuries of injustice with humor, and we do it sometimes because it, it's just. You got to laugh to keep from crying and you damn sure got to laugh to keep from screaming in rage when you see the numbers did, that we're talking what about. What did James today. Baldwin said? James Baldwin said to be Negro and relatively conscious in this country, it has you, um, well, is to be in a rage to be in almost a constant all of the time. And some of y'all are witnessing that tonight yeah. because some of our people, believe it or not, cope by not wanting to hear none of this. Yeah. Some yeah. of our people, they, not that they don't understand or know what the situation is, but sometimes they could cope and be like, I just can't deal with it. But then there's some of us who um, God has allowed to take this on. And trust me, y'all, I mean, it, 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 it's, um, it, it gets to you. And sometimes we use humor, we use ways of coping ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, um, so, and we don't apologize for it. What we're saying is, and we hope as we wrap this up, Jackie, that if you didn't get anything out of it, get this out of it. There's a new movement. There's a movement that Jackie and I are going to push, and this move, and along with others, because we're not alone, mm -hmm. along with others, and not just blacks, we have white allies too, who, who understand what's going on, and we're pushing this, man. We are not, if you don't support an agenda that's going to change those numbers that we put up there on that screen. You do not get our vote. Nope. I'm not putting one damn sign in my lawn. Nope. I'm not coming to it. And I don't give a damn. You could be a black politician. If you don't support this, then guess what? Either you with us or you against us. Now y'all understand that, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's what mm -hmm. Bush said with the um, thing on terror. That's Either right. you with us or you against us. Well, you know what? This is what it is. Either you with us or you against us. If you're not with us, to change those damn numbers. Forget about everything else. If you can remember one thing leaving this show tonight, think about 50 years. Them damn numbers haven't changed. Yep. 50 fucking years. Those numbers haven't changed. And the thing of it is, is that here we are in the 21st century. And I'd be damned if there's going to be another 50 years and them numbers don't change. So either you're with us or you're against us. I mean, there, there, there is so much information that I am going to leave with you on uh when this when the video finishes processing 
uh, there's an article from the Nation magazine that shows that blacks are losing ground in land ownership in the South. Right. And that, and we're talking about black people who whose land was passed down from their uh, uh, emancipated ancestors who bought land, and because uh, the people who who provided legal services for drawing up titles and deeds were racist, they wouldn't provide legal services to black people who purchased land. Black land uh, 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 landowners at the time didn't have proper wills and deeds, so they passed their land down. <clears throat> excuse me, to their children with insufficient records because of institutional racism. So because there were insufficient records because of racism, their their answer, their descendants are, were at risk and still are at risk of having their land taken from them by white people because of a loophole in the law because of racist ass white people. Black people who did everything right bought land. But because racist white people wouldn't help them draw up paperwork like they were supposed to, now their descendants can't even benefit from the, that they're, um, we're going to give you that. Um, real estate agents, real estate agents still discriminate against black people by not showing black, potential black homeowners, homes in a lot of white neighborhoods, and, and not showing white homeowners homes in some black neighborhoods. Uh, that, we're going to share that one with you. Um. We're going to share an Atlantic article with you. We always talk about uh, the, the the progressive West Coast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> blacks being pushed out of neighborhoods by the rising prices and black people are being pushed out of neighborhoods first. This is in Portland, Oregon. I'm going to share that article with you. Um, banks still discriminating against black borrowers. We just talked about this foreclosed mm. report a couple of shows ago. Um, the recession uh, uh, the discrimination lawsuits that came out from the recession, all these tens of billions of dollars that these banks supposedly paid. The homeowners who suffered this discrimination from the banks, they didn't get their money. They got refinance packages that were bullshit and that the very banks that discriminated against were responsible for repackaging. How is it that you steal opportunity from me and then you are still the person that I owe money to? I don't understand why we had the first black president who's a constitutional lawyer and somehow that didn't make sense. He couldn't figure out that that didn't make sense. I Just don't tell me that Barack Obama did shit for black people when you look at the foreclosure crisis all by itself. If you don't look at anything else, if you look at the foreclosure crisis all by itself and you look at the fact that the reason those banks were fined was because they violated federal civil rights anti-discrimination laws and they discriminated against black people and instead of that money going to the people they discriminated against for restitution, the Obama administration had some of the same financial institutions being responsible for the refinancing packages that the people that they screwed over had to take advantage of to save their homes. How does that make sense? And now some of these same Negroes are telling these people in Chicago that they are just supposed to support Obama ushering in gentrification on the South Side. And get the well, I mean, it's, Ooh, uh, but but again, Jesus. but again, that's our fault because see, we loved it when he sang Al Green. Oh, he so uh, when he went just, up there, when he went up there and said and, and was singing Al Green, what we should have did is said, take your ass in there and get some legislation so we can get out of this thing. <laughs> but see, but we was and you know, look, we understood that Obama was suffering a lot of racism and stuff like that's that. That's absolutely and, true. And and you know, the nature of us because we understand that we are under siege in this country. We knew he was under siege. So we know we did what we could to protect him, but we protected him at our own expense. Right. And that's what happened. Right. And Obama um, used that protection. Um, um, he, he accepted the protection. He accepted the love we gave him and the support we gave him. But then he turned around and he stabbed us in the back. And that's, and that's how I view it. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but he got a, he, look, he got a nice library though. Oh yeah. He's going to get a lovely library. Yep. Don't, don't think he's not going to build that. Like, I don't care how much those, those black people, cause black people are not, they're not happy. There are plenty of, there are a lot of activists who are opposing 
this library because we are finally you know why because we're finally getting it yeah those of us that, and see this is the thing this is what happened in the 68 which prompted the government to even do a fact-finding mission because black the masses change comes from the bottom come on all of these folks and, and look man if you went you know to hbcu or you know um you know i'm not talking to white folks right now i'm talking about you know um, um, the, you know, the Cosby generation. I'm talking about, I'm talking to all, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the black elites, you know, the black middle class, the upper middle class. Those of you who did all of the right things and said, well, what's wrong with y'all? Y'all never, y'all never was about to change. The Southern, cha the uh, uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King became the head of the civil rights movement during the Mon Montgomery bus boycott. Mm -hmm. But it was a little, uh, uh um, black girl Called that uh, Coven, I believe her name uh -huh. is, mm -hmm. um, who um, was the one who kicked off the Montgomery bus boycott. But see, classism in the black community wouldn't allow her to be the face to represent the movement. That's so they right. had to go get Rosa Parks. Yep. You know what I mean? So Rosa Parks was more respectable because it was classism. And that classism has not went anywhere mm. because, you know, they was like, oh, well, white folks, they're not going to take us seriously. We put little um, nappy-headed Corvette up there. Right, little but, teenage Right, right, little teenage mother. unwedded mother. But Rosa Parks, you know, she's respectable, you know. So what I'm saying is, is that even now, you still got the same um, black classism. That, that change, the masses is always going to agitate for change. And we've seen it in 68 when they started to get it. Mm -hmm. And we start talking to, and they was being talked to mm -hmm. by the Panthers and, and everybody else, and they started to get it. That resurgence is happening once again. Yep. And you go into these cities now and keep sleeping on the masses. All of y'all that got your little degrees and stuff and running around here and want to be in the office and all this stuff and riding through the hood, locking your doors, worse than white folks sometimes. Yep. But check this out. The hood, and we, we live in the hood, they starting to wake up. And they yeah. starting to see the game that's being played. And unless we don't want to repeat a 68, then we better get on board. Because, see, they might not understand the details of what these numbers represent. Mm -hmm. They might not really understand fully or could, could articulate like some of y'all can about gentrification stuff. But they feel it. And they see it. Mm -hmm. And trust me, don't think they're unaware of what's going on. They know they're under siege. And, and trust me, just like in Chicago, they're starting to wake up. So... This country, man, is in for a rude awakening if we don't start dispensing some justice around here. I mean, we got nothing left to take. That's that's why, that's why, you know, like you said earlier and like we have said on this show before, that's why the government's coming after y'all now. Because they know that we don't have anything because they've kept it all from us. All of this was an orchestrated effort. None of this was an accident. All of this was done through policy, practice, politics. So, so don't tell me that I need to unite with your issues, but you're not going to pay any attention to the, to the issues that are literally killing my people. No. And, and furthermore, <clears throat> Um, don't ask me to ignore politicians who are actively working today to continue to perpetuate these, these kinds of policies, because right now there is an effort to shield smaller financial institutions from having to report mm -hmm. to the consumer pri uh, uh, protection uh, the, the Consumer Protection Finance Board, I think that's what it's called, the CPFB, um, to shield smaller financial institutions from having to report data on demographics, meaning racial demographics of the people they uh, uh, give loan and financial products to. Wow. Democrats mm. are doing this. There's a, I, I'm going to share this Huffington Post, Huffington Post article with you. You know who the Democrat is? Some, some of these people talk about, oh my God, and a whole bunch of black people too, the George Reeds of the world yeah. and the Curtis Blows of the world. Man, y'all, screw y'all. You know who the Democrat is who's leading the effort for this legislation? Tim Kaine. The guy who Hillary Clinton picked 
as his, don't tell me that Russia told me not to vote for that heifer. Don't tell me Russia told me not to vote for her. We know who these people are. And if any of you who are out there, I know most of you on here are probably progressives because that's how we met y'all. <laughs> but if, but if any of you, any of y'all are out there <clears throat> who still have family and friends who are, who are beholden to the Democratic Party because that's the only chance black people got. The Democrats are the only chance we's got. What we gonna do? We's gonna vote for the Republicans? How about we say screw all of them if anybody wants our vote because see, if we don't vote for the Democrats, they don't win. And we know this. We know this for a fact. If they want our vote, they meet our demands. And if you can't get behind us with that, then y'all go up against the Republicans and Trump by your damn selves. And we'll just sit here and continue to live off oodles and noodles <laughs> and, and let us know when you need some help, when y'all start to struggle like we do, because y'all close. Y'all are close. So the next show we'll do, well, I'm sorry, what, what else you got? Nothing. I was, <laughs> was going to do a George Burns. Say goodnight, Gracie. Yes, sir. <laughs> The next show we do, we, we, we have tackled housing. We hope you get it. Uh, the next show we do, we will do, what was the next thing on the, what was it, uh, mass incarceration? Yeah. Yeah, the next show we do, we will do mass incarceration. And then the show after that, we'll do unemployment. And then the last show will be police brutality. So thanks for joining us. Share these videos. Share them from YouTube. Share them from Periscope. I don't know if you can share from Periscope. Uh -huh. Share on Twitter, however you do it. Retweet it on Twitter. Um, share this on, on Facebook. Uh, follow, subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, Luke Ma Nation, L-U-Q-M-A-N-N-A-T-I-O-N. -N uh, you can hear us now every Friday on Loud and Clear mm. Radio with Sputnik. Brian Becker on Sputnik. Uh, on Sputnik. And the latest podcast from our show, uh, uh, our segment on Loud and Clear is up on our page, as is the accompanying article from Sputnik Publications. I think that's all we got to say. I can't cuss no more. I might not. We might be kicked out of church for oh, all this. Oh, don't forget thing. about um, Pitbull and politics. Is oh, up that's right. Pitbulls and Pitbull and politics. <laughs> <laughs> every Saturday night. The new episode is up on Pitbull and Politics Facebook yep. page. Look, a lot of you guys talking about, oh, I can't click. Click on the face. <laughs> click click on, on the face. Click on his handsome Right, face. click on the face and it'll take you to Spreaker and you yes. can, you can um, hear the latest podcast. Please support Luke Mon Nation. We, we're, we're trying to do some things and we need your help. Support Thank you, Luke Lisa. Mon Lisa Nation. said we're awesome. Thank you so much. We love y'all very much. We appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Moreland Gall. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, support us on Patreon through a monthly contribution, PayPal, or GoFundMe for one-time contributions. Luke Mon Nation, search under that. That's all we got tonight, y'all. Thanks for hanging in with us. Be really good to each other. Have a good night. Peace. Peace. Uh. Ha <laughs> ha